Thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast. I'm Steven Jodorant, and yes, I'm back. Joining me, as always, are Monica Fai and Jake Watroba. For today's show, we will follow up on our latest installment of our mini-series on the potential relocation of the Columbus crew, plus give our reactions to the U.S. Men's National Team roster announcement and thoughts on the upcoming friendly versus five-time world champ Brazil and arch-rival Mexico. We will be speaking with former U.S. Men's National Team player and now commentator for FS1, Alexi Lawless, about the U.S. Men's National Team, MLS, the crew, and a lot more. Lastly, Armand Kafai recently wrote an article about the dilemma for MLS coaches regarding how they play their youth. We will look at the different angles to the dilemma and what might be done to get more youth on the pitch. Did want to tell you to follow us on Twitter, Unc Sam Soccer Pod. We always enjoy your feedback, comments, so continue to send them in. You can find the show on any major podcast platform, so go ahead and hit that subscribe, turn on the notifications because we know you don't want to miss the next episode and i highly recommend to go listen to the last episode jake and armand did a phenomenal job with the fourth part of the mini series they spoke with andrew erickson of the columbus dispatch morgan hughes frontman for save the crew and josh babeski who is in charge of mls in austin anyway let's get to today's show Armand and Jake, what's happening? It's been uh, two weeks since I've been on the show. Do you miss me? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, How I've, was Cuba? Uh, Cuba was wonderful. It was a different experience. I have to say, I I was desperate, in desperate need of wanting to listen to last week's episode when it came out. I was so excited to to hear it together. You guys did a wonderful job. Hats off. You know, buy wow. you guys around on it. It was, it was wow. awesome. That that is the nicest thing I think you've ever said to either of us <laughs> in regards to the show. <laughs> I, I I agree. I agree a hundred percent. And uh, listeners, I want to give you all uh, just an idea of how desperate Stephen was for like MLS and U.S. soccer information. He called me on Facetime audio and goes, "So what's been happening for the last twenty four hours in the world of MLS and U.S. soccer?" I only and had I only had Wi Fi for an hour, so. I had to so, make do. I had to catch up. He he also called me to ask me what was going on in sports and uh, what what was going on with the Patriots. So I had to give him his uh, Tom Brady update because I know he likes Tom Brady so much. So yeah, well, hashtag Danny Etling should replace Tom Brady. <laughs> oh my back god, the we're not going there. Anyway, sixty yard touchdown run. Where, when has Tom Brady done that in his life? Never. But he's got five Super Bowls. <laughs> anyway, uh. <laughs> Let me give you guys my reaction to last week's episode. And I, I don't think you guys did justice to yourselves because you guys kind of limited to how much you actually spoke, you know, between the interviews or before or after. So, come on, spill the spill the beans, guys. How how do we feel a week later after doing those interviews with those three different personalities, but different understanding of what's going on regarding the potential relocation of the crew? Well, I mean, it's obviously an emotional affair, right? I mean, you have all these parties involved, and they're all like thirsting for an MLS team. I mean, the crew, they want their, they want to keep their team. MLS in Austin wants a team there. It's just, it's such, it's such an interesting dynamic of this whole relocation thing's a mess. And I think Alexi Lawless said it best uh, in his little uh, halftime spiel: "If it's happening, rip the bandaid off." And just st- stop giving false hope to people because it's not right. And all this time and effort to save the crew has been putting in has been phenomenal. But if it's to, if it's all for something that's already almost done, then it's it's kind of a tough spot. Yeah, and I agree with Armand too. I mean, I I think I mentioned this on last week's episode too, either in the open or in our outro. They had Austin has came out with a logo, came out with the colors, came out with the name and they haven't even been MLS hasn't even announced that the crew are going to relocate or they're, they are in the, 
I don't even know what, what how would you even phrase it there. They're, you know, the, they haven't even come out and said we are looking to relocate the crew to Austin at the start of the 2019 season or, or something to that effect, you know. And they have they have the logo, they have the colors, they have the name. It's kind of like just a kick right in the right in the crotch to crew fans. I think I think it's disrespectful. I think it's a slap in the face. Sure. After listening to both sides, and I, I've been on record for sure, I don't understand why Austin would be under consideration for uh, a club to relocate there. After listening to Josh Babetsky, after hearing him, you know, lay out the facts about the city, about the market, I'm, I, I, I'm, 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 I'll back off that stance now. How about that? If we're, if we're, if we're backing off stances on tonight's show. Uh, I definitely see Austin as a viable now. And I knew, you, you, you know, Stephen, you used to live in Texas. Armand, you do live in Texas. You both have been to Austin, it sounds like. And I think you guys can speak to more of this uh, better than I can. But, I mean, you both say that it makes a ton of sense as a, as a soccer market as well. It has a ton of potential. Well, I'll, I'll be honest, Jake. At first, it was just me being, you know, smug. And me being a troll, like, yeah, Austin would be a great city. But the more and more I thought about it, it, it makes sense. And I could see why Precourt wants to make the move there. And let me remind you, listeners, Precourt has had his eye on Austin for a long time. Yeah, yes. Um, it was in, it was in that, you know, that famous Austin clause that was announced when he, uh, after he announced a relocation, um, one thing I, I would take away from that is it was just such a it's such an emotional affair for both sides. Um, but like Alexi Lawless said, rip the Band-Aid off. If it's happening, it's happening. I don't – it's tough to see anyone – anything stopping it outside of the law. And I think that's what every hashtag Save the Crew fan is banking on right now is, I mean, there's Model Law. Uh, being talked about right now uh, that will be talked about in court uh, this week. Um, I think that's that's the only thing. If that if that if that gets dismissed, then I think the Benny is gonna be, is gonna be ripped off at that point. There's a logo release, guys. There's a logo for Austin FC released. I, Jake was talking about off the record. But there's a logo released. There's tr- the, the, they have a nickname L Tree, like the tree, not like T R I, but. They have all these things. They have stadium renderations. Uh-huh. They, they have all these. They're passing out shirts that says Austin FC, stickers, all that stuff. It's it's basically done. If if this model law goes through, okay, then that's the only thing that's gonna stop it. But outside of that, unless owners aren't gonna stop it, you better bank. You better you that if that if that court of law agrees with the city of Columbus, then it'll be over. But MLS is ready. As soon as that, as soon as that thing's decided, they're done. Clay Hall had this on Twitter. Breaking MLS officials took an aerial tour of Columbus last week and signed off on a proposed downtown stadium site and training facility, perhaps old Copper Stadium site. Atlanta owner Arthur Blank said recently he could see soccer uh, in Austin and Columbus. Then Jeff Carlisle uh, had this tweet. Statement from MLS via text message. There is no truth to the report that MLS officials took an aerial tour of Columbus last week or signed off on any potential stadium site. Hashtag saved crew. Um, guys, are, are we just confused or what's going on here? I, I, yeah, I'm confused as to, I mean, obviously somebody took that flight. Somebody was touring those, those that area looking at it for some for some reason and i want to i want to get back to what you said about the the model law and, and folding the team i mean obviously we are no lawyers here but i'd have to imagine that there's nothing in the model law that states you can't simply fold a team or contract a team and then just move what whatever is remaining the players i guess in this in this uh, circumstance and move them to a new city at least i don't think there is i think it just simply states you cannot relocate the franchise franchise to another city so to me it sounds like mls's option after not being able to relocate is just to simply say hey it was a good run columbus crew we're going to contract you and we're going to cut a deal with anthony precourt he's going to own our new expansion franchise in austin called 
Austin FC. <laughs> uh, they are also called El Tree. Here's their logo. <laughs> Here's their colors. It's all been set up, and uh, they're gonna put a nice bow on it. And I, I, I to me, it's and I, I, I like I said, it's we're not nightmare. lawyers here, but I have, I haven't, or any that they get around that law by just contracting the crew and then awarding Austin an expansion franchise. I, I don't know, guys. It is such a baffling situation with conflicting reports and the fact that we know Precourt wants to go to Austin. I mean, he said that we're bringing MLS to Austin. He wants a team in Austin. I think it's – you can't – he's going to get it no matter what um, in terms of what he wants to do. None of this is going to stop him. He's not going to sell uh, – he's not going to sell the team. Uh, he believes he has a great opportunity to make money in Austin. I think MLS, I think in their minds do too. We've heard them. I think Babetsky mentioned it on the podcast uh, uh, when he was talking about his uh, blog post. He, they've been name dropped multiple times. You know, they weren't a team on the expansion list. I wonder why. It's, it's I don't, I don't know. Like it's it's such a conflicting situation, Stephen and Jake. It is tough. This whole and this whole helicopter thing, just throwing a wrench into things. Like, oh wow, and that was a helicopter flying over, uh, and the, the, just conflicting information. Like, what the hell is going on with this team? And like, what's going to happen? I, that Modell law, by the way, I, I misspoke in, on the show. I think I said Eric Stover, but I think Mickey Turner also touched on it as well. Uh, they, if that stands, that's massive towards cities. And it has an impact on other sports leagues, too. I wonder if MLS is getting pressure from other leagues in, uh, in here in, in the country and in Canada, uh, basically stating, don't go through with this because we don't want to find out if this law works or not. Because how many times have we heard uh, leagues and teams using potential uh, cities uh, to leverage to leverage cities into getting uh, stadiums. I mean, like, here in Minnesota, the the NFL and the and the Vikings ownership used Los Angeles just before the Raider or the uh, Rams and the Chargers were moved to LA a couple years ago. The NFL and the Vikings ownership used LA to leverage the state into paying for the uh, U.S. Bank Stadium. I mean, if you if you get rid of the if, if the Modell law works and it's constitutional and everything, and and, and cities put that into motion. Every team and every league in this country loses its leverage in getting stadiums built uh, through public funding, and now they certainly can't relocate the team if it's not successful in their eyes. Okay, but let's not worry about pub, you know funding for the stadium. These owners, uh, at least in the upper class of sports franchises here in American sports, are billionaires, so let let's not cry over you know the fact they don't get funding from. It. Let's put the taxpayer money into I don't you know fixing the crumbling roads that we have. It's a separate discussion altogether. But the but the model law it, but the model law is interesting because it says you must give a notice of uh, more than six months before you relocate a team, and I think they're arguing that Columbus has not. So the two the two things the model law uh, I did my research, guys. Um, is uh, that you need a six-month notice before uh, you, uh, I guess, either announce to leave or leave uh, to the city to the city of Columbus in the states, and um, you also need uh, to give an opportunity to local investors uh, to buy the team. Um, How's those that those legal? are two components of the model law. How is that that's, legal? That's the question. Is it legal? That's How can the question. you force that's somebody to figure it out? How do you for sorry you know how do you force somebody to be like yeah well you have to sell this like isn't it private ownership can't they kind of do whatever they want with it I mean, we're That's, not lawyers anyway <laughs> uh, we let's, talk about soccer let's talk about soccer let's talk about the off the field ramifications and kind of an ongoing theme here on the show do you think people outside of Columbus care and here is Morgan Hughes on the fan support. Can you talk about the support Save the Crew has received from other MLS fan bases? Um, man, I you know, yes, I can. I think I'll do a terrible job of it because it's been so crazy and, and so massive and, and so worldwide. Uh, I mean, just yesterday I saw this video 
I retweeted on Twitter of this uh, A-League game in Australia where, you know, like there, some supporter section had this gigantic crowd banner that said Save the Crew, and it had like a picture of Higuain, like Maram, I think, on it or something. It was just like mind-blowing. So, yeah, I can talk about it, but I think that it's just going to be another one of those things that, that we won't really understand the scope of until, you know, the book is written or the 30 for 30 comes out, you know, 20 years from now. But uh, it's been absolutely heart-stoppingly, emotionally overwhelming and and really, like, important and cool and, uh, yeah, emotional, man. Obviously, Morgan is sentimental about the situation. But, guys, at any, you know, MLS game we've been to this past season, how much of an emphasis have you seen on hashtag Save the Crew and just, you know, voicing support from supporters groups or just fans in general. Jake, what's it like in Minnesota? Uh, I haven't, I'm sure they're there, but I haven't seen any save the crew or, you know, support of save the crew in terms of banners or scarves or uh, flags or whatever. I haven't seen them at any Minnesota United game. Like, like I said, I'm sure they're there somewhere, but I mean, I'm in the supporter section too with my season tickets, and I, I just, I don't see it. I don't, I don't hear it. You don't hear "Save the Crew" chant. Like that's the other thing too, is if these supporters groups that claim they support the the movement so much, why hasn't there been like walkouts? Why hasn't there been organized walkouts? Tell me that. I mean, Minnesota United, the, the supporters groups, planned a protest. Against the beer vendors, one <laughs> one game because the beer the, the 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 union workers for the beer vendor were on strike, so we didn't buy any. I shouldn't say we because I bought whatever beer I so damn well pleased. Uh, <laughs> but the uh, people within the supporters group weren't buying uh, Miller Light or whatever the hell they're, whatever the hell the, the the vendor was serving. So if we can organize a protest against the beer vendor why can't we organize a protest against the league and walk out say at the the 23rd minute or whatever whatever it may be why why aren't we doing protests like that why aren't we seeing more banners why aren't we seeing more flags i get it the team the league they kind of look over all that well then why don't you speak with other means why don't you walk out suck out all the atmosphere out of that arena make it noticeable look at five thousand fans or however many sit in these supporter sections, just walked out. That would be news. Fans of the Baltimore Orioles years ago pl- did a walkout of the, <laughs> during one of the games because the team was so bad. They got pissed off with the, with the front office and said, we're going to walk out. And they planned a walkout of Camden Yards. I can't, like if baseball fans can do it and those aren't organized supporters groups, why the hell can't, why the hell can't any of these supporters groups in MLS do that? Uh, do people care though, outside of Columbus? Do we do do fans genuinely care outside of Columbus? Do the Philadelphia Union fans care? Do the Orlando City fans genuinely care if they suddenly have Austin on their uh, season tickets rather they than got their Columbus? Club from, from, they got their club due to relocation, Orlando City. That's true. Armand, uh, I, don't, I, I don't know. I, I feel like the the really I, I I've said this, really diehard fans care, but the guys who kind of just casual fans, I don't think they care. I think the FC Dallas, uh, they do have Save the Crew banners, Save the Crew, all this. I, I wouldn't be surprised they had a really big uh, show uh, next uh, in two weeks and the crew come to Frisco. But I think, for example, they, they have this great TIFO. Um, and uh, I feel like I, I would love to get like, a poll around the stadium because it showed, it said, oh, is this a dynamo? And it had a picture of the San Jose earthquakes. I would love to get a poll around the stadium saying how many of them knew that the San Jose earthquakes had relocated to Houston. I, no, I but genuinely how, like many, to know. how many people actually care that they got relocated to the Houston, as Houston exactly. or, dynamo? Or that too, yeah. Or how many did even know? If they don't know, that proves our theory of the forgive and forget. Yeah, well, they just, well, maybe they're just, you know, didn't know. I, <laughs> no, but Armand, you, you're correct. You know, forgive or forget. We've seen another... American sport franchises get relocated, and yeah, time passes. Yeah, we kind of forgive and forget. We move on. 
it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible situation uh, for the for Columbus. I guess for Austin, it's a fantastic situation. And I mean, we'll, I think we'll see, we'll learn a lot more this week with the Model Law being uh, tried in court. And I would love to see the implication. And I want to see if we start seeing reactions from other leagues, because there could be something big going on. I agree with Armand. It's a terrible situation for Columbus Crew fans. Um, I don't know if a great situation for Austin fans. I don't think they wanted to get a team via uh, relocation of some of, a, of another city's club. Uh, but one one thing I will add to really real, real quick to uh, uh, on the the Houston Dynamo uh, subject. No one cares. No one no, no one in Kansas City is pissed off when Houston Dynamo come to town. No one in Philadelphia is like, man, is, these assholes stole the San Jose Earthquake. No one cares. No one no one gives a bleep, okay? So <laughs> to say that people five years from now are going to go, oh, man, these MFers from Austin, man, they, they took the crew. I'm not, I hate them. I'm not going to the game. Screw MLS. They, they stole a team from Columbus. It's not going to happen. People <laughs> forgive. People forget. People move on. I don't know if that was the pessimistic – Minnesota fan in you, Jake, or the realist? It was. It, no? <laughs> it, well, I like to think my pessimism is realism. So, oh, there you go. Anyway, listeners, uh, at Jake Watrova for any hate mail. Okay, U.S. Men's National Team two friendlies against five-time champ Brazil. Who are actually going to call up some big names? Uh, Neymar, I believe Coutinho's on that list, as well as. Firmino, I think 13 in total of the 2018 FIFA World Cup roster will be there. Then we're playing Mexico, the arch rivals. Armand, you were really surprised that Reggie Cannon didn't get called up. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the fact that Shaq Moore got called up, and I know he hasn't played games because of a registration issue, but come on. What what, what are we going to do if you're, gonna, you're calling up someone that hasn't played a single game, but Reggie Cannon has started every game in MLS and looked really well? Like it's not like Reggie Ken has like been uh oh, average. He's been a top two or three right back in MLS. I'd say arguably the one of the best the best right back American right back in MLS. And you're call- and you're gonna call up Shaq Moore? Why is is it is it because uh, he's playing on uh, abroad in on a European team? Uh, I I thought that was a Klinsman thing, not a uh, a Sarah kind of thing. I thought it was a really weird uh, a really weird omission. And I'd also. I think Jake's going to talk about this, but Julian Green, why, why are we still calling him up? Like honestly, like he hasn't, he has, he hasn't, he hasn't done much, and I think there's plenty of options. Uh, you know that if Julian Green's getting called up for all this, uh, I, 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 I don't see why. Just why? Because he scored one goal in 2014 World Cup. Is that why? No, because he scored a goal in a World Cup tune-up in France. Uh, that's why. I, no, I don't understand why Julian. We talked. We were talking about this earlier. To make this really quick, I don't understand why Julian Green got called up. And I don't. This roster is weird to me. I don't know if you, if you, Stephen, agree. Uh, but there's this mix of young talent, and then there's also this mix of some of the old guard too. Which I Experience. don't understand why. But, but but why though? This these two Experience. matches don't matter. Is it is it just so that we can say, hey, we didn't get the dog crap kicked out of us by Brazil? Is that Sarah what you're can to say? want Sarah can wants the job full time, so I, I get, think he wants to perform. I think he wants to perform well. well. I think these are starting to affect. I think him being the interim coach is starting to affect the roster decisions that we're having now. That's not good. And some just some numbers. Uh, there are five players eligible for the 2020 Summer Olympics. Tyler Adram. Tyler Adams, Cameron Carter-Vickers, Weston McKinney, Antoine Robinson, and Tim Weah. You have 14 players that are 23 and under. Uh, question for you guys. Two parts. Is the fact that Christian Pulisic not named to the roster a big deal? Yes or no? No, because he's sure. hurt. Okay. I agree. Okay. If he were healthy and he doesn't get called up for whatever reason, good or bad sign? Uh, it's not an issue. It's, it's, the, the matches don't matter. Christian Pulisic does not need to play in these games. But even Christian the fact Pulisic, that he's he, played one game in the last six friendlies, Christian not, Pulisic yep. doesn't need to play until either I don't know what comes first, the next round of qualifiers for twenty twenty two or the Gold Cup. He doesn't need to play until then. So I got, Christian Pulisic can sit out international uh, friendlies until then. I got That's my, my math wrong. It's uh, he's missed six out of seven, so he's played one in the last seven. 
Uh, and I, I agree. I agree. I agree. Spawn with Jake. I, it, it's a non-issue uh, until it starts affecting games that actually matter. These are just these are just games, you know, just to see how the roster pool is doing and to make a little money on the side. Yeah, but uh, see, Dave Sarakan saying how this is in preparations for the Olympics, Gold Cup, blah blah blah. Dave Sarakan's gonna Dave Sarakan's gonna say that, but it's just an evaluation of the ro- of the roster pool. Dave Sarakan wants to keep this job full time. Like I told you, I think he really wants to keep this job full time. Uh, he wants to perform well in these friendlies and. It's gonna come at the cost of some uh, some of the young players that are uh, that probably that might not play in some of the friendlies. His job is to be the placeholder, but I mean we learned a lot about placeholders, right, Stephen? With Bruce Arena. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, no. Um. I. It is also interesting to note that we are playing Brazil with you know 13 players from the World Cup, obviously headlined with Neymar. Then arch rivals Mexico, and I don't know if it was on this show or if it was a conversation I had off off the uh, air but basically u.s soccer scheduled a lot of these friendlies just so they can make money up next alexi lawless does he really need an introduction it's alexi lawless go follow him on the twitter machine at alexi lawless alexi how's it going gentlemen uh it's a pleasure Greetings. How are we doing? Uh, we are recording this what on a on a Sunday, so uh, a chock full week of uh, soccer news on and off the field, and plenty to talk about. Oh, absolutely. Let's uh, let's just begin with the U.S. men's national team and the roster announcement. What is your mm-hmm. instant reaction to it all? Uh, so, so the actual uh, call ups by Dave Sarek and the interim coach. Uh, I'm actually pleasantly surprised. Um, no, not necessarily surprised because this is kind of what he has done and what he has talked about. Uh, it is a refreshing, young, uh, to a certain extent, inexperienced. In that, you know, some of the more experienced guys are guys like DeAndre Yedlin and, and John Brooks. Uh, but for the most part, it's I think go, in line with uh, what I would call the. Um, bathwater theory in that uh you know you kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater and there are certainly some players that while they could be uh of quality and and help going forward you this is a seminal moment i think in in u.s men's soccer history in that change needed to happen change i think is demanded right now given the failure uh, of not making the world cup and more importantly that change uh I, i think can have dramatic and positive effect because there's a lot of good young talent out there that I just kind of want to see have that ownership and take unto themselves uh, and go forward and say, all right, it's ours now, not under uh, my watch. And so whether it's a political, I know isn't involved uh, because of injury in this camp, but uh, a Pulisic and uh, Weston McKinney and, you know, Josh Sargent, maybe in the future, these types of players that are there and, and some of the players that have been around, but uh, to a certain extent, aren't as tainted with the failure as others. Was there anyone, Alexi, that you saw that uh, you thought was, was snubbed and not called up? Well, the, the, the Josh Sargent thing, and you know, we're doing the game on Fox next week, the uh, Brazil game, and so mm-hmm. we'll probably be talking about this because there's a lot of attention. He's doing really well right now for the under-23s uh, over in Germany, and I, I, got, I think that this has a lot to do with the fact that they're going to call him up to the first team uh, over in Germany, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing for him, and it's a good thing for uh, U.S. soccer, and there might have been a um, an understanding that came that because there's this break right now and maybe he gets he, he's better off training with the first team week in and week out if they are indeed going to call him up. So maybe this is uh, lose the battle and win the war when it comes to Josh Sargent, who I think. It, it, and so I don't think he was snubbed necessarily, but I do think if he's going to be part of that that group of players going forward. Uh, you should call them in. And, and they've scheduled some really good games against some good opponents. And this is where you really find out even at an early age or, or rebirth, if you will, over in Columbus. Uh, and you know, Bobby Wood, who got on this weekend for about 45 minutes, but you know, Bobby Wood's done very well with the national team. It almost be, might be a nice little respite for him to come to the national team where you know he's going to get a little, a little more service than certainly he has gotten so far uh, early days here in the Bundesliga. But uh, over the last year, he is, he's, had to, he's been forced to try to do things himself, and that's not what Bobby Wood, I think, is good at. So, and then Zach Steffen in goal, I think, is the... Uh, um, the number one, um, you know, the guys like, uh, uh, let's see, uh, you know, uh, Timothy Weah, I think there's going to be a lot of interest in him. Sebastian Lejet gets called back in after a while. So there's going to be a lot of interesting things for us to talk about next week in this game against Brazil. Alexi, uh, you kind of alluded to this in your answer here, but with with the opponents that are coming up here, Brazil, who's, you know, who 
who has Neymar, Coutinho, Firmino, and a handful of others that featured in the 2018 World Cup, along with a talented Mexico team that is, you know, our, our arch rival uh, in mm-hmm. CONCACAF, does, do the score lines to these two matches really matter? Um, look, we always are going to attach significance to what the score is. And at times it can obscure things. At times it can make you look better or worse than the reality actually is. That's, that's okay. That's, uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. I think more importantly in the, in the bigger sense is uh, if the U.S. is going to progress, we want to have a confidence that when we are playing against the elite, because notwithstanding the fact that we didn't qualify for the World Cup last, uh, this summer, the fact is that qualifying for a World Cup for the U.S. out of CONCACAF should no longer be seen as an accomplishment. Uh, it, it is something that is to be expected. And doing well against teams and, and uh, from an international perspective also shouldn't be seen as an accomplishment. Doing well against the elites of the world, that's what's going to drive us to the ultimate goal, which is to win a World Cup. And so the more opportunity we get to play against better competition, the better off it is. And that's why I say they, they've done a good job of scheduling some good quality uh, quality opponents. Uh, I think that the score will be important, but more importantly, I think we are going to kind of compartmentalize this team for a while, at least until next summer when the Gold Cup comes, where we're looking at players with an eye to the Olympics. We're looking at players with an eye to, obviously, 2022 and Qatar, and we're going to extrapolate it out. This guy did really well in this type of situation. Think of what he'll be in two or three years from now. Uh, And that's, you know, that's development. That is um, a work in progress, if you will, which is certainly what this team is going to be for the foreseeable future. The other part of the equation, guys, is there's no coach yet. Dave Sarakin (laughs) continues on. Um, You know, Ernie Stewart is now in his job, and you would think that he has an idea of what's going on. And they've talked about wanting to take the time to make the right decision. But this is getting ridiculous at this point. And it, it all points to the fact that they're not going to do anything until after the MLS season, which points to the fact that it's probably going to be an MLS coach. We're talking the likes of Greg Berhalter, which should be fine uh, with me. And considering what's happening in Columbus, and I know you guys want to touch on that a little later, but considering what's happening in Columbus, maybe they just said, you know, with Columbus possibly moving to Austin and then taking Greg Berhalter to the national team, it might just be putting uh, gas on a fire right there. And so they just wanted to hold off until the Columbus crew season is done. And then maybe Greg Berhalter comes in as that coach. I have, I have no inside information, by the way. This is just me uh, guessing and, and trying to read the tea leaves. <laughs> no, absolutely, Alexi. I think a lot of people agree that Berhalter should be. I think Berhalter is number. I think Berhalter is the uh, number number one right now. But do you think I, I said I said a really bold claim, and I think uh, it, it was interesting. Do you think Dave Sarakan potentially uh, could warrant consideration for that uh, job full time? Hot take, hot take alert. Um, no, look, <laughs> it, it, you know, I think Dave has really come to grips with the fact that he's not going to be the coach. I think he has used this incredibly in that this has padded his resume. I think that this has made people look at him in a in a different way. You know, he, he has been this incredible number two. Um, and it's not easy being a number two, especially in the way that he has been used over the years and his his value as that number two. Um, is unquestionable, but he's also kind of pigeonholed himself. And keep in mind that this is, this was originally a, a head coach. Um, so I, I think that he has done a world of good for his reputation. I think there will be people that will really look at what he has done over the past year in what has to be said is a is a really difficult type of situation and almost a no win type of situation, especially when you got guys like me and and everybody talking about how uh, who, who the person is that's going to come in and take your job. I think he has used this to. Um, almost the best effect that he possibly could. And I think he will go on. I don't think he will be involved going forward, regardless of who comes in. And I think he understands that. Uh, but I, I hope uh, that we see Dave Sarakin in a head coaching position uh, going forward, because I think he's shown that he certainly has uh, the ability to do that. And he's certainly come out of that number two position that he uh, put himself in for the last few years. Alexi, I want to move the conversation to the fact that Dempsey or uh, Clint Dempsey retired this past mm-hmm. week, and a lot of the conversation in U.S. soccer has been the Donovan versus Dempsey debate. Now, I think on the field you can make the argument for you know either player, but what about off the field? Who do you think had a more of a significant impact on U.S. soccer as a whole? Oh, it's interesting. So I'm, uh, I'm actually, uh, I just finished writing uh, uh, my State of the Union monologue uh, for my podcast, um, which we record tomorrow. So I'll give you a little a preview of what we're talking about. Obviously, it's a big story in U.S. soccer uh, with Clint Dempsey, a, a true legend when it comes to the game. Uh, very, very different when you compare and contrast him with Landon Dunham. I always said that if I, if I had one game to play in a World Cup, 
uh, and needed a goal, I would still go with Landon Donovan. But if I needed someone to back me up in a uh, in a bar fight, I'm still going with uh, with Clint Dempsey. Or certainly, if it was a uh, a pickup game, you're going to pick uh, Clint Dempsey. Such different types of both players and personalities. I think that if you're talking off the field, I still think that Landon Donovan did more off the field, and that was by design. Clint Dempsey is stoic. He does not suffer fools. Uh, he has very little time for small talk. Um, very little time for the media, to be quite honest. Uh, and that's, that's fine. That's his decision. But it is, it is, it is you know, in a certain way, helped him because it's created this air of mystery around him. But uh, it certainly has not helped us to do our job. And I think from an off-field perspective, uh, given how good he was and given uh, the opportunities that he had, uh, he probably could have done a whole lot more. But, you know, you don't, you don't want to force someone to be something that they are not. And that's uh, um, and certainly he has cultivated an image um, because that's what's comfortable for him. And uh, and I got to respect that. And, and to a certain extent, I got to love it. I, it would not surprise me in the least if he just fades off into the sunset, goes fishing and we don't hear from Clint Dempsey. It would it would not surprise me, but it would sadden me because I think he still has a lot to give to the game, especially when it comes to teaching and and talking about how he uh, he approached the game with a a bravado and a courage and a beautiful arrogance that enabled him to believe that he could do things that others said he couldn't or didn't believe that he could. And maybe that's his greatest legacy and his greatest gift to a uh, to a generation. Um, Alexi, do. You- do you think we'll see any any players that kind of resemble Dempsey? I know you mentioned he was stoic. He had this bravada about him. Do you see any players like that in the, you know, coming up through U.S. soccer? No, I think that in this day and age, uh, they're actually much more near and dear to my heart in the recognition that they are um, in the entertainment business. And maybe, you know, the social media world, that exists lends itself much more to having players uh, be much more open and out front and public. um, And they think they recognize their ability to cultivate a brand at a much earlier age. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I I, I consider it a good thing in that they understand that they are uh, performers and they are entertainers. It doesn't mean that they can't be authentic and genuine and truthful and passionate and competitive in the way that they go about their business. But ultimately, they're going out in front of a, uh, a public in, in a stage, which would be the grass, uh, in front of an audience, which would be the supporters there, people that are paying money to see it. Um, and people are interested in who they are as players on the field, but also who they are as personalities off the field. And um, I don't, so I don't think, I think it's, uh, you're looking at a, it's not a dying breed necessarily, but I think it's a, a breed of player that is going to be few far between. And in that sense, you need that much more uh, wonderful if and when players like that come along. But I just don't see in this generation of players a lot of players that are more are less comfortable with being you know, out front. But for the most part, I think they all recognize that they are performers, they are entertainers, um, and there is a public image and a benefit to having that public image be out there because of their brand. Alexi, you cover the Bundesliga for FS1, uh, and it seems we've, we've seen this trend of a lot of uh, you know, MLS uh, Academy players going to Germany, and it seems like Germany does value the young American talent more uh, than you see in England or France or, or Spain. Why do you think that is? We were talking about this actually on the uh, on the show this morning with uh, Kate Abdo and uh, Jovan Karaski was with me, but I was talking about also with uh, with Ian Joe. I think that there is, and, and I think it's just cultural. Uh, I think the German culture, for whatever reason, I, I don't claim to understand it to that to the to the depths that others do, but I just think that they have an ingrained respect for what America and American players have done, the challenges that they have. And there's also a, a business part of it too, where they recognize that there is some pretty good talent that they can acquire at a much lower uh, price than other places. Now, they're not gonna come with the cachet that other, that other uh, nationalities may come with, but ultimately when it comes to kicking the ball, they can go over there and they can find some players that, especially younger players that they don't cost a lot, that they can nurture and I think there's just a cultural willingness, much more so than other places, to play younger players, regardless of what nationally, but play younger players. And I think that that just lends itself to um, the American soccer mentality. Maybe it's maybe it's 
it's it's a parallel uh, or a relative connection and similarity between the German mentality at times, and I'm not talking about all of it, but at times and in certain aspects and the American mentality when it comes to how we view sports and certainly how we view soccer. The why hasn't t- the transition happened here in MLS? Uh, Reggie Cannon had mm-hmm. a quote in Armand's story basically saying that, you know, in MLS, quote, I feel like it's we got to get these three points this weekend and it's whatever it's going to make that happen, we're going to do it. They may not play the kids that are ready. I think it's hindering some of them, and that's why kids are going to Europe. Yeah, yeah, and this is a risk that MLS is willing to take, and it's by, uh, you know, by their own design um, with the way that they have structured this league. Because, you know, if uh, I believe that it's market in that I believe that if you want to have all players from uh, you know from different countries and that's your business model when it comes to selling your product that is an MLS team go for it I don't even think there should be any restrictions uh, so if that's what you want to do fine but the opposite side of it is saying all right you do do restrictions or you do mandatory you mandate that teams play a certain amount of minutes or certain and certain uh, uh, you know domestic players or US men's national team eligible players whatever you want to whatever you want to call it uh, but I, I just don't I don't believe in that. Um, and maybe that goes against development and an opportunity. But it is not MLS's responsibility to better um, the U.S. men's national team. It is also not necessarily MLS's responsibility to be- to better soccer. Now, do they want soccer to be better? Yes. But their responsibility is to better Major League Soccer. And they have decided that this is the way to go. The other part of this, guys, is I don't when people talk about youth development, it, it, it it's mind numbing to me. I, I don't I don't care. I don't want to see the finished product. And when I'm spending money, I don't want to be part of a program that's years long. I want to see something now. You're going out. You're you're once again, this is this is entertainment. You're going on stage. I want to see players that can provide uh, exciting and entertaining moments now. It doesn't mean that they're not going to get better. But I don't want to pay and sit around for watching players uh, develop, especially when I look at other teams and compare and contrast, and they're going out and they're buying ready-made players. Now, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's just how I look at sports entertainment. And that applies, by the way, to, uh, to any sport in any league. But I recognize the importance and the value of having a good developmental academy and having a good pipeline and, and having an integrated system and uh, and, and that kind of stuff when it comes to a league, because you're fostering and nurturing not only the uh, the future stars that you could possibly sell on and make money. So there's a business aspect, but also the ones that are going to score goals and win you games and turn you into that club that you want to be. So I, I get it from both sides. But um, unless they're willing to mandate something, and I think that that would be a mistake. This is the business that MLS has decided. And this is the system. Uh, and this is the business template that they have decided to go with. Alex, I'm going to push back here because you said something interesting. You said you don't want to watch a product, you know, that's not finished. You want the finished product, and MLS is still growing. But then how does the Bundesliga, arguably one of the best leagues in the world, have that image where they play the kids, yet people still watch? Well, I think that there's first off an ingrained uh, history, um, and much more so when it comes to MLS when you're talking about I me. Mean, look, we're... I have uh, Atlanta United on in the background playing against D.C. United. Atlanta United is in its second year of existence. It's going great guns, and, and there's lots of folks. But when when there is a a longevity and a history associated with the club, I think it lends itself much more to um, being much more accommodating and accepting of that. Uh, I also think that that when it comes to the Bundesliga, keep in mind that, you know, for example, Bayern Munich, okay, uh, they, you could, you could theoretically make a case that the other teams are basically the farm teams for Bayern Munich, and so the structure of of uh, of the Bundesliga is very, very different in that um, they they have a built-in audience based on history, but they also recognize that they are cultivating assets that appreciate in value, hopefully, if they if they are if they are good, and that's that's certainly something that can happen from an MLS standpoint, and it's happening more. Uh, but I think that they have to be much more selective as to when they do it. You know, for example, uh, you know, the, uh, the Philadelphia Union, who we talk about uh, with, with young, uh, developing talent. Now, that is their business model in the way that they are doing things. And when you come up with a compare and contrast with other teams, you're going to appear less sexy. And 
to a, to a certain segment, the development and the ability to see players' development, that is interesting, but not enough people. And if you want mass people to uh, partake in your product, it's really, really hard, I think, to convince them to buy into a program that is years before you actually see something come to fruition. I think that's asking your consumer and your customer to do much more than most, than most teams around the world ask them to do. Uh, and I think when you're talking about a young league, still a relatively young league, less, I think it's a bridge too far when it comes to asking the customer to do that. Alexi, I want to I want to uh, shift gears here uh, to uh, what's going on with the Columbus crew and down in Austin, Texas. Uh, you uh, last week you you went on a uh, <laughs> I don't know if halftime rant is the right the right thing to call it, but you, you basically went on this uh, you know thirty second minute long monologue about uh, MLS hope to both sides of the aisle and, and, and Columbus and Austin and how they should rip the bandaid off and, and, and tell it like it is whether it's going to the crew are going to be in Colum uh, Austin next year or if they're going to be in Columbus. Uh, what were, what made you uh, go on that rant? Well, I mean, look, I have uh, a, a pulpit, a platform uh, on television and, you know, I want to make sure that, uh, that I use it to, to good effect in that I want to be informative. I want to be entertaining. Uh, you don't have to agree with me. As a matter of fact, many people often disagree with me and that's okay. Uh, but when it, when it comes to Columbus, this is a big story uh, as to what the, what is going to happen with one of these original teams. Uh, it has gotten ugly, but I think uh, whether it's the owners who have allowed this to happen, uh, certainly whether it's Anthony Precourt, which I who I think uh, he and Precourt Sports uh, have mismanaged from a from a public relations standpoint, uh, many many aspects of this. But whether it's them uh, or the or the MLS owners or Don Garber, everybody knew this was going to be messy. Everybody knew that this was going to be complicated, and um, everybody knew that this was going to elicit incredible amounts of passion uh, from uh, from both sides. To be quite to be quite honest, and so I wanted to talk about it. I don't have uh, all the answers, but I at least like to to throw out some possibilities. And you know, I talked about uh, I talked about USL and that kind of stuff. Now we're going to find out a whole lot more here in the next uh, week because that. Um, uh, uh, that ruling, or at least uh, an airing of the grievances, is going to have uh, happen from a legal standpoint. We're going to find out how much, or little, or if at all, the Modell uh, rule applies. And I listened to your uh, your podcast last week. I thought you did a good job and a good balanced job of bringing uh, of bringing both sides and getting some of this stuff out. Because look, as you mentioned, this is 90 seconds on television. It's impossible for me to get all of the details out, and I'm not going to go into the weeds about something that. I want to bring as many people into the tent and give them a much, uh, an admittedly a 30,000 foot type of uh, look at it. But I don't want Columbus to move. But as I said in, uh, in my halftime, um, I will fight for the right for somebody who owns a business if he or she believes that a different location is going to make that business stronger. And by the way, that business is part of a bigger business. And in doing so, they believe that uh, the entire business is going to be stronger. I believe that they should be allowed to do it. Is it is it something that I want to have happen? No. If they can work a, a situation out where everybody's happy and Columbus continues on, uh, that's fine. But I've yet to hear a um, a legitimate uh, solution to this other than just don't move Columbus. Well, that that's 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 not something uh, I think that is constructive going forward. Okay, just sell it. Fine. All right. What are you selling it for? Because when you're selling it, you're not just selling it in 2018 with the, let's say the 150 to $200 million range that teams are going right now. You're also selling it with the understanding that Anthony Precourt, who love him or hate him, you have to at least respect the fact that he was shrewd in his business right here, has the opportunity to go to Austin, a place where he believes he's going to have a better business. So you're also going to have to pay him for money that he may lose in the future and potential money. So it gets... It, it gets really interesting and ultimately, as I said, very, very complicated. I don't have I don't have all the answers. I completely sympathize with the folks in Columbus uh, and the predicament that they are in. And and in more importantly, as I said, of the mismanagement at times, cruel, unusual, uh, unusual how they have been treated. I can't empathize because I've never been in that type of situation in terms of the teams that I love possibly moving to a, a, a different market. But I certainly can imagine and so I can sympathize with. Uh, the situation that exists right there, and uh, I don't think I don't think this ends with anything other than heart. When it, from a Columbus standpoint, anything other than heartbreak, uh, sadness, cynicism, and scorched earth when it comes to MLS and how it is viewed in Columbus. Now, b before before you came on, Alexi, we were actually uh, just having a, a little discussion 
uh, we're having a little discussion before you came on, Lexi, about uh, the save uh, the save the crew and Stephen and I and Jake. We we've seen displays of hashtag save the crew across the league, but uh, there's a consensus among us that w- uh, that you know leagues forgive and forget. I mean, we saw with the Seattle Sonics and the Oklahoma City Thunder. Um, sure, there's some fans that are uh, still upset about that move, probably in Seattle, but I feel like it hasn't had any effect on the NBA in general. Do you think that uh, that it'll be more of a forgive or forget situation, or will it be a lot stronger in this instance? Well, see, so that so that's the, the, the big question. If Anthony Precourt does move his team to Austin, a place that he has wanted to move, obviously, for a long time and believes in it, and, and I can certainly make the case from a, uh, from a business standpoint as to why he has this love affair with, with Austin. But ultimately, I, I, uh, I don't want this to happen, but if it does, I'm fascinated to watch the pressure that he and this team is going to be under to be successful relative to other teams and certainly relative... Uh, to Columbus. But if in five years from now, Austin is going great guns and selling out their brand new soccer specific stadium and killing it when it comes to sponsorship, uh, having a, uh, a huge fan base, having a community and a market that embraces this team from start to finish, uh, a, la, a la Atlanta, even though I know it's a little apples and oranges when it comes to these two markets, uh, is that not better for not only the business of the whatever we're calling, I, I, I'm I'm not in favor actually of calling it anything crew like, and I also am not in favor of taking anything from the crew. I think you you keep it in Columbus, but whatever the 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 way that we look at this new team is that not good for the new team, and in turn good for MLS. If that's the case, and it's and it's going and it's incredible. Everybody looks fast and says, you know what, that was a a smart move. While it hurt and I don't like it, it was a smart move from the entire business of MLM. Then I think, yeah, I think people will forgive. Now, if it is a complete mess and they're not getting crowds, and you know that compare and contrast is going to happen immediately when they see any empty seat, uh, as 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 should be, because you know hell hath no fury like a scorned uh, MLS community. And if that's going to be the case, uh, fine. Now, the other part of it is if, as I'm told. Columbus is such a great market, and uh, it's just mismanagement when it comes to Anthony Precourt and MLS, and they just don't want to be there. Then somebody should look at that as an expansion team and should be able to come in there and have that thing be incredibly popular and successful um, because uh, and be able to utilize and be able to harness the incredible power that I'm told exists there. But the, as, that, as I said, the people in charge were just unable to uh, to find a way to consistently harness. Last question here, Alexi. It's a huge talking point on our show that MLS 1.0s tend to get, uh, I would say, not forgotten, but just not looked at all that often. Do you think this opens the door for other owners to look at other options and say, you know what, my team here struggles, let's move them? I think so, but but yeah, this is this is also something interesting. Everyone always, when we talk about metrics and that kind of stuff, everybody says, yeah, but what about Colorado? Or, yeah, what about Dallas? And they throw in other teams. What they're not saying is the most important part of the equation, and that is those places the owner wants to be there. If an owner doesn't want to be there, then it completely changes the equation. But keep in mind what's about moving to Austin. The reality is that any team in North America, really, and in any league, has a clause in that there is a history and an understanding that teams can move. And I think anybody that has followed professional sports in North America would recognize that that is a possibility. Do you want it to happen? No, you don't want it to happen from a supporter standpoint. You don't want it to happen from an ownership standpoint or from a, uh, uh, you know, a commissioner standpoint or anything like that. But the potential for that to happen happen exists and we have plenty of history in all of the sports including soccer where that uh, where that can happen so i don't think that this move in any way makes it any more likely uh or pushes other owners to be looking for a move because i think those other markets um i think the owners want to be there now have they utilized those markets and have they uh, have they been able to use them to the greatest effect not not necessarily and that's that's a problem, but that's a problem within the market from the ownership group. But I don't think it's a problem that leads to that ownership looking to a grass is greener type of situation in a different market. Alexi, we can't thank you enough tonight for uh, joining us. Uh, please tell our listeners where we can find you on Twitter, where we can find your 
your podcast and any other thing you may want to plug away. Yeah, so my name is Alexi Lalas. I used to play soccer back in the 1900s, and now I talk about soccer here in the uh, U.S. for Fox uh, Sports. You can find me doing, as you guys mentioned, Bundesliga, and uh, we'll be on the road next week doing the U.S. men's national team. We do all the World Cups, so I just got done in, uh, this summer in Russia. I'm looking forward to next summer in, uh, uh, in Paris uh, for the Women's World Cup. Uh, the State of the Union podcast with myself and the great David Mossy, um, uh, who uh, it's a privilege to work with each and every week. You can find that on Stitcher and uh, iTunes and all the, you know, Spotify, all the different platforms out there. And I just want to say, you know, I, I, I do a lot of podcasts and I have over the years, uh, big, small and everywhere in, in between. And the fact is that this soccer community, while we while we agree or disagree about different things, that's that's fine. I, I embrace that type of uh, of debate and that type of even at times criticism. I love the fact that American soccer people are so invested and they have taken ownership of this incredible sport and the unique aspects of it when it comes to our country. And I just want to thank you guys uh, for everything that you do. While a lot of us that kick the ball get a lot of credit for what the sport has become, the reality is that there's so many other people that um, in different ways are contributing to the sport. And what you guys are doing uh, is contributing to the sport that we all know and love and onward and upward. And I wish you all the luck uh, on the field and off the field as you go forward. Thank you guys uh, so much for having me on. Oh, there you have it. Alexi Lawless. And before we get into the conversation about MLS youth uh, citing Armand's piece here, any reaction to anything he said? I, I agree with it. <laughs> I, to be quite honest, I, I do you agree with his, his Columbus stance? I know this was uh, considered hot takes on Reddit last week and Twitter when he had his halftime speech. I Let me preface this by saying I agree with about 75% of what he said in his rant last week. I think it is a backhanded like slap in the face to give a <laughs> Columbus a USL, USL club. Team. <laughs> uh, you know, but for the most part, what he's saying, rip the bandaid off, let everybody know where they stand. And I think he's right. And I think he was right again this week too on the crew moving to Austin. If you can, if you, if MLS can look at Austin and say, we can be better uh, business wise in Austin versus Columbus. Why wouldn't, why wouldn't we do that? If they can be, you know, if, if we can fill a, a stadium of 20 to 25,000, you know, that holds 20, 25,000 people in it. And it's selling out every single week. Why wouldn't we, why wouldn't they do it? It makes so much more sense. And I don't know how anybody can sit here and disagree with that. And like he said too, it's say the crew will admit this too. So I don't want to get any backlash on Twitter about this, but pre quarter isn't running the crew the right way. It's pretty clear and obvious that there's things that are going on marketing wise or business wise with, with, with the crew, and that's why it, it suffers. So, like he said, if an ownership group sees that from afar, an MLS maybe has to see that from afar, why can't they be considered for an expansion team in, in, in you know within the next five years and a new ownership comes in and does things a different way and, and really extracts from that market uh, and gets things out of it that Anthony Precourt wasn't able to? I find it funny that the Columbus crew have been successful on the field. Like, through all the BS, the team has been quite good. I, I just think that's a silver lining. Uh, and, and then I think one important thing Alala said that I, we just, uh, I think, failed to mention on the show is the fact that the owner does not want to be in Columbus. Like, you know, you, you can scream and all that, but it's his team. It's his money. You know, he kind of has the right to do, you know, whatever he wants with it, you know, as as shrewd as that sounds. No, you know, you're, he... you're, you're right, Stephen. You're right. And I think the one thing that people – and I think Alexi hit on this and it's also in the back of my mind – is that when he's selling a team, he's also selling it with potential future profits in mind, right? Like you're not – like if he's going to sell a team for $150 million, but he believes he can make $300, $350 million or something like that, he's not going to sell a team for $150 million then. MLS, what we've seen MLS values go up so much, right? We talked about it on the show. What it was like, it was like a massive percentage jump. I think it was it Toronto or something where it was like, like the expansion fees has gone from like 20 million to like 150 million. So, like, if he's going to sell the team, 
Would he? Would he? I don't think he'd accept anything 150, 160. He'd probably want 300, 400, because I think that's what he believes the future values are going to be. And I think it's an underrated aspect that is kind of ignored. And it says, why didn't you sell the crew for 150 million? No, it's like those. Yeah, good point, Armand. Anyway, let's talk about uh, your story here this past week, <laughs> MLS Youth, Armand. And uh, how about you just tell us what the main gist of your piece was? So, I mean, I, I talked to Reggie Cannon after training. I think it was on a Sunday, actually. Um, and we just I was just talking to him about the, the season, and he brought up, you know, that some youth players are, you know, just not, not making, not, you know, getting time, and that they got to keep going and keep pushing. So, I mean, we see a debate, play your kids or not player kids we've seen Doyle's tweets uh about you know how Andrew Carlton isn't playing or Jonathan Lewis isn't playing for NYC we've seen all that but why why is that the case and why can some teams do it but other teams can't and I, I talked to Reggie I talked to Os- uh, I talked to Oscar about all these things and basically just so it was um, they believe that MLS is more result was dri- result driven as is any league but that the playoffs are a litmus test and that this is kind of hampering teams like uh, hampering youth, excuse me, uh, in terms of their players getting better. Don't you think out of all the leagues in world soccer, MLS has the most, you know, throwaway games? Just the fact that you could be Seattle Sounders and have an eight game right, winning streak no, exactly. and then you're suddenly exactly. at the top, of, almost at the top of the West. No, I, I think I think I think you're spot on in that analysis. I think I think me, you, Jake have all talked about how you know Seattle, they're, they're garbage for the first part of the season. Then they make this late run, bring in some DP like Raul Ruiz Diaz, and just go on this. What was that? Nine games unbeaten now, something like that. Eight. And, eight there you go. And, and they're what eight points out of first after being like de- almost dead last for a uh, majority of the time. I mean, come on. But that's why that's what I find so ironic about Cannon's quote there. He's like, "Well, in MLS, the three points matter." I'm like, "Dude, the, the home and away disparities between you know clubs' records is massive. Like, we all know clubs on the road suck. You know, if you can pull results on the on the road, that means you're a pretty good team. You win your games at home. Uh, you, you have a a season where you're going to be competing for a playoff spot. I I, I just find it." kind of a weird statement that you know Cannon's saying you know it's a throwaway league and then you go to Europe where you have promotion relegation where every point is going to matter because it's going to you know end up where how much money you receive from the TV rights and from the league uh, uh, you know and if you're going to be relegated but Jake what's your take on this I don't understand why like like you said there are a lot of throwaway games in MLS so you get to August, September, I mean, you got teams like San Jose, Colorado, uh, Orlando City, who are basically all out of it. Uh, And this is what, I mean, as a Minnesota United fan, this is what drives me nuts. You know, why is a a, a 35, 36-year-old, however old he is, Ibsen, getting playing time over a young, uh, early 20-year-old Brazilian central uh midfielder uh, maximiano like i don't understand i don't understand that you're out of the playoff put you're, you're you're not pushing for the playoffs you're you're basically playing for next year why aren't the kids getting run and and you hit on it too there's no promotion relegation so what's the backlash what's what's it matter if you if you lose you know a few more extra games because you played the kids and not to mention too i mean like you said the row the home and road split is so it's such a big difference you know you're you're basically hoping as a good team to pick up draws on the road and you know and hold serve at home. I mean, you could even argue if you were a a, a a bad team, you know, playing the kids in the road, let them get the away experience in MLS, playing in sometimes hostile atmospheres. It, it, it doesn't make any sense that these clubs and it don't don't play the youth, and you can even argue that it's a uh, market inefficiency within MLS. <laughs> wonder where we've heard that before um something i wrote for the uncle sam website an mls league official said it spent more than 40 million in each of the last two seasons on youth development focusing on improving training facilities bolstering academies and attempting to find new and better ways on how young players are trained good news is that mls is making strides to improve fine right you know you improve the facilities the academies, you know, for training. 
but ultimately, are they getting more playing time? And uh, this came out, I would say, at the beginning of this year from Alex Olasky. I'm going to butcher that name, so forgive me. MLS does a really bad job of playing young American players. Like, really bad. Also, before you ask, it's not improving. Has been at 2 to 3% for a number of years. So he, he has a chart there that says, Percent minutes played by U22 domestic nationals. MLS sits at 2%. Syria, 4 EPL, 4.5. La Liga, 5.1. Bundesliga, 76 And League at 9.2%. Guys, do we see it ever going to improve with this, you know, what Reggie Cannon and Oscar Pereira say, this, you know, playoff-driven league that that's all that matters? Uh, it's, it's tough because, I mean, you want – you want to get results. You want to win. And that's the most important thing. However, I think what people are saying is that there are players that are quality and ready to play. They're just not getting uh, opportunities. Um, and it, I'm, not, I'm not sure because we've seen the success of Atlanta United. How many of those players are academy and domestic internationals? I'll wait because there's only once. Andrew Carlton... And uh, I think Bello, uh, the the right back or the fullback, he's not going to even touch the, t- touch the field. I mean, I think you can make a case for Miles Robinson, but Atlanta United's the best team in the league. But who's a counter to that? Red Bull, who is uh, who develops teams, uh, who develops players on Red Bull too. I mean, we've seen it. Aaron Long, who's developed uh, really well. Uh, we saw uh, Brian White score a goal on Wednesday. He's U twenty two. So there's so much. There's so many, like, okay, there's this point, there's a counterpoint to it. FC Dallas, they play their academy. They're in first place in the Western Conference. It can be done. I just, I feel like the easier way is just, you know, uh, just splurge a lot of money like Atlanta United and get the instant results and then go and build your academy like that. Because you want that relevancy. You want that relevancy. And then after that, once you get once you get those results, then you can start. Okay, there's not that much pressure on me to get that many results. I'll start playing the kids a little bit. I don't know. It's a weird. It's a weird question. I mean, I, I, I t- to me, I think it, it. I don't know if it's necessarily going to rise until MLS raises the profile of the league as a whole in terms of quality. I don't. I guess I don't blame MLS and its ownership groups for saying, "Well, we can't play these kids. We might as well go sign." You know this middling Brazilian in, <laughs> in some uh, Who, lower... Fernando Bob? Yeah, thank you. Uh, we're not going to sign the Fernando Bobs of the world, get people excited that there's a, a Brazilian in the league or something like that, just to raise the profile, just to raise the excitement with fans. But what I what I do want to ask you guys is uh, Liga Mekis has, the, has, a, has a rule uh, basically saying uh, teams must play, I believe it's... Uh, U21 is a certain amount of minutes. I, I, Armand, can you do you know the exact rule? Yeah, yeah. It's um, the the exact rule is uh, they have to be uh, born in 1997 or uh, after, and it needs to be given 765 minutes uh, uh, per season, basically. So you you need uh, just 765 total minutes um, from those players, and I think if you don't complete that, you get docked three points. So I want. I want to I want to read this uh, this state uh, taken out of an ESPN article. Uh, it's a quote from a uh, player, basically stated that I'd implement a rule in which a percentage of young Americans under age 21 has to get a certain amount of minutes during the year. In Mexico, they have the nine uh, nine nine rule, where you have to have at least nine games on the game, or at least nine Mexicans, sorry, on the game day roster. Uh, do you guys think that MLS probably should look into a, a rule like this? I know Lalas in his interview stated that he doesn't believe that this is MLS should go in this direction. But if you know we're talking about why doesn't youth academy products get playing time, this might be something that MLS may need to look at. Guys, I I don't know because the funny thing is that Liga MX rules about domestic players, right? At least nine Mexicans. So that's obviously in link with the federation and their goal with l tree no you're right you're right i it it is the i i don't think 
the thing is, if you want domestic players to play, I feel like, like Alexi said, there's going to have to be a policy involved. The question is, many teams in Liga MX have circumvented it by playing fullbacks. Uh, you know, I guess that's a position uh, in their eyes that it doesn't need that much, as much experience and can be compensated, you know, with the center backs covering or the center mids covering any weaknesses that they see. But, I mean, you've seen players in uh, Liga Mekis like uh, Diego Lainez uh, from Club America, I think, got two goals and assist in his first match. So it's proven to the benefit. But, I mean, you're right, Stephen. It is in line with El Tree and the Federation. So does USSF really want to get involved with – I mean, they are involved in MLS, but do they want to, you know, get even further their involvement within the league? Oh, that's going to piss off all those pro-rel guys. Oh, that would make them so angry. Clearly, USF, you know – Linking arms with MLS would just be a bad nightmare of a PR problem that would never end. Uh, that's just a side note. I think I don't think USSF will touch that. I don't think I see MLS doing that because it's also players like Barco who has no ties to U.S. soccer or you know wasn't brought up through the academy system and he's technically you know a U22 player. No, I I I, I agree I agree with you, Stephen. Uh, Jake, I mean, what what do you make of it? Do you think it, it's more of a it's it's more of a domestic, or it should be just an overall U twenty two U twenty three issue? It should be a domestic, and like you said, Armand, uh, <laughs> uh, these teams in Mexico are are hiding their young uh, their young domestic players at at fullback, and I guess that explains why the U S has struggled so much in that category in developing fullbacks historically because we don't we don't uh i guess hide them in mls somewhere to get playing time to get experience help them grow and develop but i i I mean i a rule like that it wouldn't bother me so much i mean mls isn't one of the top leagues in the world and i get that it's the top league here in the u.s and in canada but you mls is it potentially is missing a huge opportunity as a business to develop some of these players to get them on the field to market them to teams in europe or 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 even in mexico and you can sell them on for profit later on down the line i think that's uh something that mls should be looking at and i think that's a a huge uh opportunity cost that they're wasting all i could imagine and see right now is if mls implemented a rule like this all the political nightmare and the fallout for it would just be relentless And it would just be, I just, I could already see it coming. Oh, you know, MLS, you know, domestic players, you know, what what do you think that, what do you think MLS will be called? Oh, every, every name in the book. Yeah, exactly. I mean, mean, come on. Anyway, uh, follow us on Twitter, Unc Sam Soccer Pod. Follow myself at Steven Jodron, although I don't tweet that much. At Armanka5 for the latest regarding FC Dallas. At Jake Watrova for hot sports takes in general. Yeah, go listen to last week's episode, that mini series regarding the potential relocation of the Columbus crew. Jake and Armand did a wonderful job. Hey, Alexi Lawless listened to it, so <laughs> you should too. Uh, yeah, we'll be back next week. Till next time. Mm-hmm.